Well, the young people will be proud of me. I'm going to be real modern today. I'm going to use an iPad. Can you believe that? Probably won't work anyway, but... Good to see everyone. I hope you have your Bible with you today. I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 6. I want to do this a little bit different today. I want us to see how do you take a verse out of the Bible, any verse, and find out how to really understand it the way God wants you to understand it. Now this idea of everybody just sitting around and everybody saying, well, I think it means this and I think it means that and I think it means this, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how to bring out of the text what God intended for us to get from the text. And that's different than everybody just sitting around commenting what they think. Now the verse I want us to look at is Romans chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Paul wrote to the church at Rome, he said, But God be thanked, you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. What does this mean? We know what it says, but what does it mean? We've been talking in the last few weeks about the beauty of the Gospel. Go back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, the very beginning of the book. Romans chapter 1, the first verse. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, separated unto the Gospel. Separated from the world, separated from his former religious life, separated from a life of sin, separated from that unto the Gospel, Romans 1.1. Then verse 2, which he had promised afore by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And what's the Gospel about? Verse 3, concerning his Son, made of the seed of David, declared to be the Son of God with power, by the resurrection from the dead, by the Spirit of holiness. By the Holy Spirit, He was raised from the dead, declared or confirmed to be God's Son. That's what the Gospel is about. Verse 1, Paul separated unto that Gospel. Verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. Why was he not ashamed? It is the power of God unto salvation. Unto everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. In the Gospel is revealed God's plan to make man right with God. That's why the Gospel is good news. That's why the Gospel is good tidings. Because Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. We have all sinned. We all deserve spiritual death. But the Gospel is God's plan to make us right with God. What do we do with that Gospel? How should a human being respond to that Gospel? Not merely say they believe it. It should be the focal point of a Christian's entire life. 
that gospel must be obeyed. Romans 10. Romans 10. Notice what Paul said in verse 16. Romans 10, 16. For they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? Hundreds of years earlier, the old prophet Isaiah had predicted some people will not obey the Gospel. That's a sad fact. But it is a fact. There are some people who are just not going to obey God. They are so enamored with this world, so enamored with its entertainment and its lust, so enamored with its materialism, with its power, that they are simply not going to obey God the gospel it's a sad thing but it's the truth they have not all obeyed the gospel Romans 10 16 then he made that famous statement verse 17 so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God so what are we supposed to do with this gospel obey it Romans 2 verse 8 what do we do with God's truth? Just say we believe it? Oh, I was brought up that way. I believe it. Do you believe it? Just saying I believe it's not enough. What are we supposed to do with God's truth? For those who are contentious, Romans 2 verse 8, and will not obey the truth, There are some people who are not going to obey the truth. Some people won't do it. I've had members of my own family that I love dearly would not obey the truth. What's going to happen? Romans 2.8 They will encounter the wrath and the indignation of God. He's not going to just blink his eyes after they have died and say, well, you did the best you could. I know you had a hard life. I know you didn't do what I asked you to do. I know you didn't obey my gospel. I know you weren't faithful, but I understand. For those who are contentious and will not obey the truth they're going to find the wrath of God. So the gospel must be obeyed. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. Paul explained clearly to the Thessalonican brethren the sad result of those of you who just will not obey the gospel. What's going to happen to you? You think maybe somehow, some way, because at one time you believed the truth, you think somehow God's just going to overlook your unfaithful life? For those who simply just will not do what God says because of family ties or whatever reason, you think God's just going to blink His eyes on Judgment Day? Paul tells us what he's going to do. Do you believe the Bible? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. You who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them who know not God and who obey not the gospel. What's going to happen to them? 
who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power. Some folks are not going to obey. They're not going to do it. And somehow, some way, they have dreamed up in their mind, somehow they're going to be okay with God because they believe in Jesus and they're religious. What does this say? Those who will not obey the gospel will be punished with everlasting destruction. What's going to happen to them? They will be separated from God from all that is good and holy forever and ever. So it's a serious thing not to obey. Now go back with me to our text. What did Paul say in verse 17? He's writing to Christians. Thanks be to God, you were servants of sin. That word servants means slaves, doulos. Thanks be to God, Romans 6, 17, you were the servants of sin, but what happened? You obeyed all these verses we've been looking at. You obeyed sincerely. I asked a young lady one time who wasn't living right. She had a good heart. She's living a very worldly life. I said, why did you obey the gospel to begin with? She said, so I get the car on Friday night. I said, you've got to be kidding. She said, no, I'm not kidding. My parents were so religious, so strict. Of course, it was their fault, according to her, that the only way she could get to use the car on Friday nights was to obey the gospel. I said, do you think that that is acceptable with God? Do you think God will accept that? She said, well, no. Romans 6, 17. They obeyed from the heart. It was sincere. They loved God. They appreciated what God had done for them. They repented of their sins. They obeyed the gospel. Thanks be to God, you were slaves of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart. That form of doctrine, doctrine means teaching, so you have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching that was given to you. And then look at verse 18. After you obeyed, all the denominational world says all you got to do is just believe in Jesus. But look at verse 18. After they obeyed in verse 17, then in verse 18, What's it say? Then they were freed from sin. Then they became servants or slaves of righteousness. They were slaves of sin. They obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered them in verse 17. Being then made free from sin. When were they made free from sin in verse 18? when they obeyed that form of doctrine that was delivered to them, when they obeyed that form of teaching that was given to them, that's when they were made free from sin in verse 18. Then they became slaves to righteousness. So they obeyed the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 1. Moreover, I declare unto you, brethren, the gospel 
which I preached unto you, which also you received, wherein also you stand. In the Gospel. By which also, verse 2, you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and rose again from the dead according to the Scriptures, verse 4. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4. What do you learn from this passage? What do you learn here? The key facts of the Gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, are the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the key facts of the Gospel. Question. We said you've got to obey the gospel, Romans 10, 16. If the key facts of the gospel are the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, how can you obey the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? How can anyone do that? That's the good news. That's the key facts of the gospel. How can you obey that? How is that possible? We've got to obey the Gospel, Romans 10, 16. The Gospel are the, the key facts. That's the key facts. How can you obey that? How can anybody obey that? We'll go back to our text, Romans 6, 17. These people obeyed from the heart a form of teaching. How can you obey the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Paul said you can obey a form of it. That word form, Romans 6, 17, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. That's the Greek word tupos, which means you make a, stro a stroke with something and it leaves a mark. Like a die. Or you have a big club and you hit on something and it leaves a mark. That's the mark. That's the form. The word means pattern. You have obeyed a pattern of teaching. Doctrine means teaching. So you can't obey the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. How could you obey that? You can't. But you can obey a form of it. You can obey a pattern of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Well, how can you do that? Anytime you come across a verse in the Bible and you really have trouble understanding it, a lot of times if you'll just read the verses above it and below it, the Bible sheds a lot of light on itself. And a lot of times that will help you understand it. What is the context of Romans six seventeen? Go all the way back to verse 1. Romans chapter 6. Look at verse 1. He's already told them in chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So since we've been justified, we should just live any way we want to. Nobody's business. We're saved. Just live as we please. Well, some people apparently believe that way. That's what he's going to address in 6.1. Yes, you've been saved. You've been justified by the grace of God. You've been justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 1.5, that faith, of course, is an obedient 
submissive faith? He answers that in Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? We just keep living in sin so grace gets bigger and bigger? Then we love God more. Look how much God loves us. The more we sin, the more grace we get. So should we just continue to live in sin so grace just gets larger and larger? That's what he asks in verse 1. Notice how he answers it in verse 2. God forbid. That's the intensified form of the Greek word, no. We would say, no way. Forbid. Absolutely not. That's why the King James translators, the, the strongest form of no they could think about is, God forbid. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 1, verse 2, God forbid. How shall we, Christians, who obeyed that form of doctrine, verse 17, verse 2 and 3, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He doesn't say you never sin, because you do. But you don't just continue a life of sin. How shall we that are dead to sin, we died to sin, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Look at this. If we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. The old man has been crucified with Him that the body of sin might be destroyed. Then henceforth we would no longer serve sin. doesn't say we'll never sin, but we're no longer slaves of sin because now we have forgiveness. When you're baptized, immersed into Christ, to have your sins forgiven, you actually die with Christ. As He died on the cross, you die to the intent and practice of sin. What do you do with a dead person? You bury them. We are buried with Christ. The old life is buried with Christ. It is repudiated. It is buried in this beautiful act of faith. The old life is buried with Christ and baptism. Colossians 2.12, also written by Paul, says, Buried with Him in baptism, wherein you also risen with Him through faith in the operation of God who raised Him from the dead. And then what he say in verse 3 through 5? We are raised to walk in newness of life. We have a new life after baptism. Why? Now our sins have been forgiven. It's a new life. Doesn't mean you'll never sin. <laughs> you will. I do. You do. Everybody does. You're not perfect. But you have a new life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Newness of life. So that's how we obey the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's a form of it. We die to sin as Christ died. We bury the old man of sin in the watery grave of baptism. We walk Arise to walk in a new life. 
we reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ every time someone is baptized. That's obeying the gospel. Then he explains about this being dead in verse 7. He that is dead is freed from sin. When did you die to sin? Romans 6, 3-5. When you were immersed for the forgiveness of sins. Then in verse number 7, that's when you were free from sin. Isn't it a shame that the denominational world teaches that baptism is not even necessary to be saved? Is that not a disgrace? What a lie. That's when we're free from sin. That's when we obey the gospel. But now look in verse 8. If we be dead with Christ, we believe we'll also live with Him. We have died to sin. Now we live with Christ in a new life. Look at verse number 9. Knowing that Christ is raised from the dead, death hath no more dominion over Him. He died once. That's over. Death has no, no, no more dominion over Christ. In verse number 9. Now look at verse number 10. He that is dead, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now look at verse 11. Likewise reckon you yourselves also dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that beautiful? Baptism is a beautiful act. It's not just an outward sign of an inward grace. Who come up with that nonsense? It's a beautiful thing. We have died now to sin. Then in verse 12, he reminds us, let not sin therefore reign. Doesn't mean you'll never sin, but don't let sin take control. Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey and in the lust thereof. Then look at verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. That's the point. Submit to God. Yield yourselves unto God and your members as instruments of righteousness. The members of our body at one time were used only for selfish reasons. Now they are yielded to God. That's the point in verse number 13. Now look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion. Sin doesn't have control. Not that you never sin, but it doesn't have control anymore. Verse 14. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You're not under that old mosaical law anymore that couldn't deliver from sin. You're out of that condition. Now you're under the grace of God. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Then look at the question. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants to you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Verse 16. Don't you understand that who you give your life to, that's who you're a slave to? Are you a slave to entertainment? Are you a slave to to drugs? Are you a slave to alcohol? Are you a slave to sex? Are you a slave to your family? Are you a slave to your job? Do you not know that whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, His servants you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Then he says in verse 17, But thanks be to God, you were servants of sin, 
but have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And then in verse 18, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So what does he mean in verse 17, you obeyed that form of teaching? He, he meant you obeyed a pattern of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ all the way from verse 3 all the way to verse 16. He makes that clear. That's what it means to obey God's gospel. Now, a lot of people think they've obeyed the gospel and they've never obeyed the gospel just because you think you have. Well, I know I'm all right. I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, I know I'm okay. Uh huh. Have you obeyed this form of teaching? Not some denominational form of it, but have you obeyed this form of teaching right here in the Bible? Not some traditional view, but the view of the Bible. Have you obeyed this form of teaching? God's given you one more opportunity. Would you obey Him now while we stand and while we sing?